My name is Aaron Brezzo. I'm one of the co-coordinators for the Winter Roundtable Conference. Um, super excited to present Dr. Cobb and introduce him tonight. He's a professor of journalism at Columbia University and a staff writer for The New Yorker. And he writes about issues that are directly critical to the work that we do here, um, taking on the enormous complexities of identity, racism, and systemic injustice in contemporary America. And Dr. Cobb has a lot of accolades, but we're running late, so I'll just name a few. Um, so recently in 2015, he received the Sidney Hillman Prize for Opinion and Analysis Journalism for his New Yorker columns, in which he combined, quote, the strengths of an on-the-scene reporter, a public intellectual, a teacher, a vivid writer, a subtle moralist, and an accomplished professional historian. He's also the author of a recent book, The Substance of Hope, Barack Obama and the Paradox of Progress, and his essays have appeared in publications ranging from the Washington Post to the Progressive and the Root.com. He's also contributed to a number of critical anthologies, including In Defense of Mumia, Testimony, Mending the World, and Beats, Rhymes, and Life. Um, and I, I feel like I'd be remiss to say, as a millennial, um, if I sort of missed saying that his Twitter is also just incredibly amazing. Um, <laughs> I don't know if any of you follow him, but it's very funny um, and very sharp. Um, so in his bio, he describes himself as a foxhole atheist and skeptical citizen. Um, he writes and tweets with the same sort of grace and audacity about politics um, as he does about blackness and also the latest trends in leather footwear. Um, <laughs> Dr. Cobb is recently really into Dr. Martin's, which I can relate to, that feels good, um, into the wingtips. Um, and I was sort of looking through for something to quote that felt poignant, so I'll read you one quote um, from his Twitter. Um, so this was posted just yesterday in response to another user. This other user challenged Dr. Cobb during an online debate about the ethics of our 45th president. Um, this user asked, quote, what evidence do you have that Trump is a hateful bigot? <laughs> hey. Thank you. So um, with Dr. Cobb's trademark care, subtlety, and wit, he simply replied, quote, LOL. <laughs> so welcome. Good evening. Um, how are you all? So uh, I'm aware that there was a little bit of a mix up in terms of schedule. Uh, and I kind of got here as quickly as I could. I was in Washington, DC. Um, but I'm very glad to be here. And I'm happy to be able to um, have this conversation with you all. Uh, in addition to writing about the issues that um, I've been known for in terms of race and policing, one of the uh, first things that I began to write about in The New Yorker was race and education and the ways in which uh, our disregard of the educational system is implicated in all the other civic concerns uh, and crises that we confront as a democracy and as a society right now. And unless we are aware and willing to confront that and willing to acknowledge that, we will not get anywhere in terms of uh, helping or addressing the, co the concerns that we see in the rest of the society. So, you know, you have my salute. I'm uh, happy to be in, in your company. Let me say, let me tell you, begin with an uh, anecdote about the election and where I was and, you know, what was said to me. So, I was in North Carolina on November 8th. The New Yorker dispatched me there to write about uh, voter suppression. And I was there with uh, Reverend William Barber, who some of you know from the NAACP in North Carolina. And we'd gone around to uh, some of the outlying areas in eastern North Carolina, some of the impoverished communities there. And we were looking at the difficulty in accessing the ballot and whether or not people were going to be able to vote and you know what some of the impediments were and so on. And we got back to Durham uh, around the time of the closing of the polls. And like many people, you know, I watched the returns with a growing sense of dread about what was happening um, in the country and what we were witnessing, what was uh, transpiring. And so I stayed up most of the night. I slept very little. And the following morning, I got to the airport for a flight back to New York. Um, I boarded the plane and sat down, and behind me, there were two women. I noticed there were two women who were in the midst of a conversation. 
And at some point, I noticed that uh, one of the women seemed to be crying. They're kind of sitting behind me. And then I, it sounds like two people are crying. I turn around. And in short order, both of these women are sobbing. Um, and these are two white women who are maybe in their 40s. And I wondered if this had something to do with the election. And so after a moment, I just kind of struck up a conversation that kind of had composed themselves and I, and I asked if, if it in fact had to do with the election. And they said something I found striking, that in the course of just talking with each other, they realized that they both had uh, relatives, close relatives, with uh, developmental disabilities. And they were horrified, they were crying at the thought of the type of cruelty that had been validated and what they thought their relatives might have to experience over the course of the next four years. And this recognition, I think it was one woman's son and the other woman's brother, maybe, but close family relatives. And they were both, when they realized they had this connection, they both began crying because they thought that a particular kind of cruelty, given what we had seen during the campaign and the ridiculing of a reporter um, who had a physical disability, that they thought that this kind of cruelty had been validated now in the highest office in the land. And one of the women said, and I told them you know, that I was a writer and I was there, had been covering uh, the statewide races in North Carolina. And one of the women said, well, well, what happened? How did this happen? And I said, I'm not sure that any of us know. And the woman next to her said, oh, I can tell you how this happened. Uh, this happened because of a crisis in education. And she said, I'm a teacher, and we have been ignoring education for 40 years. And when you ignore education the way that we have, you produce an electorate that is capable of being misled in the way that this one has. And that stayed with me because if we are to ever confront where we are and how we got here, we will have to confront the failure to educate our population and the success in miseducating the population in very many ways and the context and the way in which none of these things can be kind of neatly parsed from each other. So how did we get here? And what are the things that we're concerned with? And what are the things that people who are concerned with social justice should give thought to at this point in time? I'll tell you a quick story. I spent the last, well, about three weeks, actually, in December and January in um, Charleston. And this is another story I was working on. It was there to cover the trial of Dylan Roof. And it was a very difficult place to be. And there was uh, the, a kind of secondhand trauma that we experienced hearing the trauma of the family members and the survivors who had been in this church in June 17th, 2015, when nine black congregants were killed uh, simply because they were black. And hearing the story, we saw the crime scene photos, we heard the 911 calls, we uh, heard the witness testimony, and it became a kind of um, burden to go to the courthouse and kind of experience this. But of course, it's like professionally you have a responsibility to do this, but it's very difficult for any of us to kind of keep a professional distance. And at one point, one woman is uh, giving testimony and I realized that the sketch artists uh, who were in the courtroom were crying and that there was a sign language interpreter and she was crying um, and that the journalists, myself included, had at points, different points in time, been crying. So it's a very difficult experience. And in the context of this, I started talking with a gentleman by the name of Malcolm Graham. And uh, Mr. Graham is a former state senator in North Carolina, but he is also the brother of one of the victims in the shooting, a woman by the name of Cynthia Graham Hurd, his older sister who had been a local librarian. 
She'd worked in the Charleston uh, Public Library System and also in the College of Charleston, the University Library System. Been a tremendous re resource to this community. And Mr. Graham had taken it as his charge to make sure that the world understood the importance of his sister's life and everything she had done and all that she had contributed and what she had, uh, had felt could be achieved in this community by fostering and furthering literacy. And this is the cause that she dedicated her life to. And so at the end of the trial, the sentence is announced. He is uh, given, I think, nine life sentences and 18 death sentences. Uh, and they're kind of handed down, you know, one after the other. And the following morning, I leave Charleston, first thing, 6 a.m. flight, and I, you know, go fly to New York, land at LaGuardia, um, go from LaGuardia to JFK, uh, which was not as simple as just saying that. We all <laughs> know that that was actually a haul. Um, and amazingly, I actually make it to JFK in time to get this flight. And I go to San Francisco, uh, where I had an appointment that evening. And you know, when I landed in San Francisco, I realized not only had I been in the air most of the day, uh, but I had not spoken to anyone, because I had the kind of heaviness you know, with me. And part of me was kind of eager to get away from the scene of the crime, literally the scene of the crime. And you know, I get to San Francisco, and uh, I take a taxi to my hotel. And when I'm in the lobby, I just strike up a conversation with the person standing next to me, who was a bellman, uh, a gentleman by the name of Aaron Thames. And we get into this conversation. I ask him, uh, you know, where are you from? Are you originally uh, from the Bay Area? And he said, uh, I've lived here for a couple of years, but this is not where I'm from originally. And I said, well, where are you from originally? And he said, I'm originally from Charleston, South Carolina. And I said, are you serious? And he said, yeah, why? And I said, because that's where I'm coming from. He said, what brought you to Charleston? And I said, uh, I was there writing about the trial of Dylan Roof. And this stricken look crossed his face. And you know, he said, uh, that man took someone very important away from me. And I said, who? And he said, my childhood librarian. Her name was Cynthia Graham Hurd. And so, I mean, it stopped me in my tracks because I had kind of foolishly thought that I was going to leave Charleston in Charleston. And I'd flown, as I kind of pointed out like that morning, I'd started out in my hotel, which was maybe a half mile from the Atlantic Ocean. And by the end of that day, I was probably a quarter mile from the Pacific Ocean. And the first person I talked to had been directly affected by the trauma that I had been seeking to leave behind. And what that said to me was that the issues we're concerned with cannot be relegated to any particular locale, that they match perfectly to the geography of the country itself, that the borders of this problem can form exactly to the borders of the nation that produced it. Now, we are seeing a vast increase in the kind of hostile language, the appeals to fear, the successful attempt to campaign by turning one person against another and playing upon anxieties, antique ancient anxieties that are buried deep within American history. And it reminded me, kind of watching this play out, of the parallels in history. And so on June 17th, 2015, Dylan Roof does what he does in this church. And in the midst of this shooting spree, one of the people um, who was shot was a young man by the name of Tawanza Sanders. Having already been shot, he uh, struggles to his feet in an attempt to distract Roof um, from shooting someone else and says, why are you doing this? Uh, you don't have to do this. 
And in response, Ruth says he is doing this uh, because you all are quote unquote raping our women and taking over the world. This is what he says. On June 16th, 2015, the current occupant of the White House began his campaign. He took that ride down the escalator uh, in Trump Tower, surrounded by the people whom he had very likely hired to cheer him on, took the ride down this escalator and said that he was beginning a campaign for the presidency because there were Mexican rapists and murderers in the country. This is 24 hours before, it's only about 24 hours that separates these two things. Now, I'm not positing a causal relationship between this. I'm not saying that what happened in Charleston was a consequence of the conversation that happened in New York the day prior. But I am saying that in both these instances, we see an appeal to a particularly poignant and sharp and enduring kind of American paranoia around the menace of men, in color, men of color and rape. Exactly 100 years before this happened, exactly 100 years before any of this transpired, D.W. Griffith released his racist classic, Birth of a Nation. Now, we all know this film. Some of us have uh, seen the film. Some of us have shown the film. And you know, we think about this film for two reasons. When we talk about cinematic folk, they tend to think about the uh, technical innovations that came about with this uh, film. And you know, American cinematic history traces its origins in many ways to the first blockbuster this, in the epic sweep, sweep of this film. Others, people who are concerned with social justice, historians and the like, tend to see this film as a kind of capsule, perfect capsule of the racist ideologies of the earliest 20, early 20th century and the ways in which the depiction of the period following the end of the Civil War amplified and reinforced uh, existing stereotypes and fears about black people and black, the alleged menace of black criminality. If you don't remember the plot of it, it involves a northern family and a southern family. Uh, the northern family is thought to be kind of more liberal on matters of race. The southern family is much more in line with what we would have associated with the typical thinking on race, the Camerons and the Stonemans. And after the daughter of the uh, northern family is nearly raped by a black man, she kind of heroically hurls herself off a cliff rather than be so defiled, uh, the northerners begin to recognize that the southerners have been right all along. And so the most disturbing thing about this film is not the racism of it. We could say that this is a capsule of a particular moment in American thought. But more disturbing than that is the proposal that D.W. Griffith presents in this film. And the proposal is that exactly 50 years after the end of the Civil War, when this film is released, Northerners and Southerners, white Northerners and white Southerners, could cement the fractured bonds of national unity along the lines of their shared contempt for black people. He says that what we have in common is that we both hate the Negro, and this will be the basis. This is why the film is called Birth of a Nation, and this will be the basis of our new uh, unity, our new enduring national strength will be cemented along these lines. And more disturbing than what he said in the film or what he depicted in the film or the kind of racist um, imagery in the film is the fact that Griffith was by and large right in his prediction. When we look at the ensuing history of the 20th century, this is what we see. We see the Great Migration and African Americans begin to move from the South to the North, from rural areas into urban areas and the, you know, also in the Midwest and so on. And you begin to see race riots and mob violence and the birth of things that, of uh, racial attitudes and practices that resemble what people would have associated once with the Deep South. And so one of the kind of best examples is an image uh, that I have and uh, it's from, it's a very easy kind of image to find, but it's a billboard that says, we want white tenants in our white community. 
And whenever I show that image, I ask students, you know, where do you think this is from? And they always say Mississippi, like always Mississippi, you know, um, and to the point where I, you can almost feel bad for Mississippi. <laughs> almost. Um, they're saying like, you know, Mississippi is like the New York Yankees of American racism. <laughs> and so, um, but then you say, no, it's not Mississippi. They say, where is it? And they say, well, um, Tennessee, no. Alabama, no. Arkansas, no. They run through all the southern states, all the states of the former Confederacy. And when they've exhausted that list, I say, this image is from Detroit in 1942. And they're shocked by that. And it was like, partly because now we think that Eminem is the only white person who lives in Detroit. <laughs> but also because they don't have an idea of northern segregation operating in the same way. But this is February, and when we look at, uh, you know, we are indebted to the historian and educator Carter G. Woodson, who in 1926 began something called Negro History Week, uh, which in 1976 was expanded to Black History Month. Uh, and Dr. Woodson wrote about this. He talked about the kind of nationalizing of the, question, of the race problem, that as the migration happened, you began to see the same sort of dynamic that D.W. Griffith had predicted in 1915. Now, Griffith was looking forward, but he could just as well have looked backward and seen how American history has worked in this regard. So I'll kind of give you uh, a, um, an example of this. In the 1870s, there came to be a great deal of concern about a particular ethnic group that was bringing drugs into the country and bringing crime was associated with general decline and also stealing jobs from whites. One of the amazing things a historian who I studied with um, pointed out kind of the amazing illogic of racism that you can have it allows you to hold contradictory ideas simultaneously. So whenever we kind of find a group that we don't like, we stereotype them as lazy, but then we also get upset that they take our jobs. <laughs> and so and he was like, have you also noticed that also the people who we always say are unclean are the people who we force to clean, <laughs> right? We hire them to clean, and so, those sorts of things. Um, so we have like these contradictory dynamics. But in the 1870s, this idea uh, proliferates and it culminates in uh, groups like the Working Men's Party in California. They are very concerned with the Chinese, specifically. And it's in this basis that we generate, that we see the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. It comes about as a result of this. If we were to move a little bit further into the 20th century, around the time of Birth of a Nation, we could see concerns that there are groups in the United States, a particular religious group that is allied with um, other groups abroad who do not have the best interest of the country at heart, who are tied to terrorist causes, and who the federal government and the Department of Justice believe we are justified in one, placing under surveillance, and two, expelling from the country. That population is Jews, who people associate with Bolshevism, and whom they uh, associate with anarchism, and the bombings that have happened uh, that are attributed to anarchists. And that culminates in the Johnson Immigration Restriction Act of 1924. And what comes out of that is the, the National Origins Act. And they say that we are going to take into account where you were coming from and what your ethnic background is before we allow you into the country, which may or may not sound familiar, depending on how closely we follow current events. But what the 1924 Immigration Restriction Act does, the Johnson National Origins Act, is that it says we will allow people into the country based upon your percentage in the current population. We will look at the census 
and see how many of you are in the population currently, and then we will allow a percentage of that number to come into the country. And rather than take the 1920 census, census, which is the most recent one, they grandfather it back to the 1890 census, which is to make sure that the people who have come here since 1890 were not represented in significant numbers prior to 1890. And so we will replicate more of the kinds of people who we want to be here. And of course, this has serious implications 15 years later, as there are Jews fleeing Germany in an attempt to get away from Hitler and the Nazi regime. And when we see those shameful images of those ships being turned around and people being sent back to Europe, where very many of them died, it is that legislation specifically that is responsible for it. And so we move a little bit further into the 20th century, and we see with African Americans a movement that begins in the 19, uh, really in the post-war period, but gains steam in the 1950s, and the, what we come to be called the Civil Rights Movement. And there's a tremendous period of legislative change that happens uh, between 1954, 1965, that more or less decade period where there are all these reforms that we associate with civil rights in this country. And the idea of producing a kind of actual egalitarian society. And shortly thereafter, we begin to witness a kind of politics of backlash, where we see the, uh, even in 1964, when Barry Goldwater runs for the presidency on an anti-civil rights platform, and he you know, fails miserably, one of the kind of worst electoral losses in American politics to LBJ. Uh, but inside that is the kernel that becomes modern conservatism. And we see four years later when Richard Nixon runs and he deploys the Southern strategy, which is to gather together the resentments of whites who feel that another group is taking advantage of them or is moving ahead of them and gather together these resentments, particularly among Southerners, and you actually have an electorate. As a matter of fact, when Richard Nixon lost to uh, John F. Kennedy in 1960, the, one of the states where he absolutely got his clock cleaned was Mississippi. Kennedy killed him in Mississippi. And then when you turn around eight years later, and Mississippi provides the Nixon with one of his biggest margins of victory. And so what had happened in between those eight years was not that Richard Nixon had become a different person, but the politics of resentment and the politics of fear and the politics of division had come further into fruition. And so if we look in 2008, in November 4th, in that incredible euphoric moment in which we witnessed something that none of us had expect, expected or anticipated ever seeing in our lives. And that is the election of the first African-American president. And this was not something that any of us could have predicted. Uh, at the time, I remember pointing out that no historian, no political scientist, no uh, uh, sociologist, None of us, no public policy person, none of us who actually pay attention to these things was thinking that we were, a, the country was prepared to make the kind of seismic shift that it, that it did. Only a handful of people had ever won statewide, black people had only won, ever won statewide office. Uh, only a handful of people had ever won governor or senator races um, after Reconstruction. And so uh, you would have no belief that somebody was prepared, the country was prepared to uh, elect a black person in a 50-state race, where one, winning one state was difficult enough. As I kind of always tell my students, so in 2007, there were exactly four people in the country who thought the country was prepared to elect a black president, and they all lived at the same address on the south side of Chicago. <laughs> and so, and the, the two youngest were just believing what their parents told them. <laughs> and so, This barrier falls, that's what the New York Times says in their, um, their headline. 
And I remember in the midst of that, I had a conversation with a good friend who'd worked in politics uh, for years. And he said to me, you do know there are going to be consequences for this. And I said, yeah, I know. And he said very presciently, you do know that the, that the Voting Rights Act is gone, all right? And I said, yeah, probably so. And then we saw in 2013 in the Shelby v. Holder case, the Supreme Court struck down the Voting Rights Act or Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act, essentially gutting the law. Uh, and, and kind of logic, the legal logic, boiled down essentially to saying that the law protecting black voters was effectively discriminating or stigmatizing white Southerners uh, by saying that you expected there to be racism in the electoral process, which was kind of thinking the worst of white Southerners. Never mind the fact that there had been this whole lineage of lawsuits preceding that. There had been more than 200 instances of uh, discriminatory voting practices in the county itself, the county that, was, that sued to get rid of the Voting Act. And so this is how we find ourselves. There was another dynamic that began to happen, and demographers notice this, and people who, uh, political scientists, people who do public opinion surveys, that early in the Obama years, you began to see a small but notable number of whites who, when questioned on matters of race, would say that the most disadvantaged group in the country were, in fact, whites. It was like one of those things where you raise an eyebrow and go, hmm, that's interesting. And, but it proved not to be noise, kind of statistical noise. It was resilient. You saw this dynamic again and again, and increasing, and increasing, until in some instances you could actually find pluralities and majorities of whites who felt that the most disadvantaged group in American society were whites. Now, this boded for a lot of what we saw last November. But it also is a kind of particularly hallucinatory logic that this does not conform to anything we know empirically, that when we look at infant mortality, we look at life expectancy, when we look at uh, lifetime expected earnings, uh, when we look at educational achievement, when we look at uh, home ownership, when we look at uh, employment discrimination, we look at every, all these indicators, kind of every index that we have of the quality of someone's life we see clear racial correlations in which the groups that have been disadvantaged tend to fare worse than um, American whites do. But this was a kind of inconvenient fact to a narrative that fit into this lineage of thinking in America. that There was a group that was taking advantage, that there were people who were imperiled, that we were in that birth of a nation moment in which people had to rally themselves together in order to fend off a menace. And so when we talk about uh, kind of intersectionality, I was talking with the students and I said, uh, you know, what we had in 2016 was a year-long seminar on intersectionality uh, because the kind of summation of it could be that people who hate some of us generally hate all of us. We found this kind of being replicated we were having uh, courses where, or having circumstances where places on college campuses that are here, maybe institutions that we don't necessarily um, hold in, in as the highest regard as we should, are now becoming vital. All of a sudden, people want to go to the women's studies department to find out what's going on. People want to talk to people who are in ethnic studies programs to find out what is going on and how it is that we got here. And so I think in terms of talking to you, the, the most germane thing that I can take from this is that the front line of this struggle will be fought in what we teach ourselves and what we teach our young people about democracy. We have failed to educate this country 
on what actual citizenship is and what are the implications of citizenship and what are the uh, implications and the requisites of democracy and more fundamentally, what is it that allows us to recognize the humanity in each other? And until we have learned those lessons, we will remain susceptible to these cycles again and again and again and again. And so I want to wrap up so we have enough time to have um, questions. But the last thing that I'll say about this is that this is a very kind of dire narrative. And it can be depressing to think about. But I find myself optimistic because at each of these moments in which we have seen these crises that I have elucidated and talked about uh, this evening, we have also seen people of conscience who rose up and said, not in my name, who said, I believe in democracy, I believe in freedom, I believe in recognizing the humanity of my fellow human and my neighbor, and that I believe that we can bring a different world into existence. And it is that narrative, and it is that tradition, and it is that vital strand of humanity that we have to hold close to ourselves, that we have to remind ourselves of, if we are ever going to achieve the actual democracy that I believe we all have as a shared goal. Thank you. So we have time for questions? Yes. Okay. I'm just going to project. We could probably do one question. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Make it a good one. We can do two. Okay, two. We can do two questions. We have, we have one in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Hello, Dr. Cobb. Oh, you got to speak up. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm nervous because I, I appreciate your work and I appreciate your speech. Um, I, uh, my name is Oni. I'm a doctoral intern. Mm -hmm. And one of my challenges in training have been my supervisors and my trainers. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, as a doctoral intern, again, who has not graduated and still need my degree, how might you um, advise or what what if anything, can be done when certain dynamics are being perpetuated mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. certain comments are being made and so on and so forth. But again, as a student, you feel like you don't have a voice, mm -hmm. but you also feel compelled to say something. Mm -hmm. um, it's right. I get this question frequently. And I think I always recommend this. Um, there's a talk that uh, um, Nell Painter gave, the historian Nell Painter gave several years ago. Um, I think it's uh, available. You can uh, find it on the internet as well. It's called uh, Survival Advice for Black Women in Higher Education or something like that. Um, but it's actually applicable to lots of people, not simply black women. I actually um, heard that speech and was taking notes and was thinking uh, about all the useful um, observations that she made in there. So I would, can't walk through the entire thing, but I would say look at that. But one of the things that she said and that it stuck with me was to find um, allies and mentors, they may well not be in your department. <laughs> they may well not be in your institution, uh, but you have to find people who are invested in you, um, even if that means you have to kind of go afield, far afield to find those people. Uh, and so because we are kind of short on time, I won't go through all of the things that she said in there, but she said, she said it much better than I could. Uh, and I think that's a good place to start. We have um, one more. Nell Painter, N-E-L-L -L Painter. I just also want to say that I just appreciate um, hearing you and being in your presence. And I'd like to hear you say um, or speak on your thoughts about fake news and um, cons conservative radio talk oh, shows God. in particular. Um, so I don't know if you saw today that, um, you know, the president denounced uh, the media again, then banned the LA Times, New York Times, and CNN, um, and uh, you, don't, you don't have to share my politics to think that this is dangerous. 
Um, and I think that it's perfectly fine to critique media. Um, and I say that as a person who works in media, that there are lots of the things that people who are outside media are upset about or disturbed about, that there are people who are inside media who are also um, concerned about. And so uh, that's perfectly fine. But the idea of saying that there is um, you know, this kind of uh, epidemic of, of fake news, the biggest problem I find in that is that th there has been so much fake information proliferated from the White House. And so it has become a kind of means of um, you know, deflection, um, of accusing people of actions that are in fact, like we have fact checked. We had a series at the New Yorker called Trump and the Truth. Um, and you know, PolitiFact at one point was measuring that 71% of his public comments were not true. And so, and then things that are just kind of verifiably false. You say that crime is at a 47 year high, I and mean, that crime is actually at a 47 year low. Um, and like, these are the things that we as a public have to engage critically. And when we talk about education too, we have to have a kind of media literacy as well. Um, because when we see uh, uh, information from Joe's blog uh, and information from you know, the Wall Street Journal um, or uh, the New York Times, we should not hold those two things in equal weight. And I say that I don't mean that the New York Times is infallible or the Wall Street Journal is infallible, uh, but simply you do have an investment in reputation uh, and so if you are false or you are wrong and you are proven wrong, that is a kind of institutional embarrassment that, that pure ambition places a something of a check on people, whereas there's no accountability for Joe's blog. And if that's where you're getting your information from, you're in a very dangerous position. Now, uh, the final point I'll say about that is that were this simply a matter of um, the individual temperament of one head of state, it would be, be, be bad. But what I think makes this worse is that this behavior so closely parallels what we see with authoritarian regimes, that what they do is begin um, discrediting and campaigning against free media and uh, the kind of outlets that are giving people information about what it is, in fact, that they're doing. And that is very close um, to what we have seen in this situation, parallels. So I joined the ACLU. I'd never been one, a member. I probably should have joined years before. I subscribe to a bunch of publications uh, that, uh, that I support, that some of which I critically support. We say that I think that there are things that you get wrong, but I think we're still better off if you exist than if you don't exist. Uh, and I am kind of doing everything that I can in my own work to support the idea of holding people accountable. Uh, and if more of us do that, at least we'll be in a better position than we are right now. So thank you.